Good morning. My name is Janet Galarno. I hope you all had a great day yesterday, enjoyed the banquet as much as I did, and I welcome you today to of Organics Con Organic Connections Conference and Trade Show. Our, our first speaker today is Darren Qualman, Director of Climate Crisis Policy and Action for the National Farmers Union. Darren is the author of the 2019 report, Tackling the Farm Crisis and the Climate Crisis, and the 2019 book, Civilization Critical, Energy, Food, Nature, and the Future. He farmed for two decades and has degrees in history, biology, and political studies. In this session, Darren will be doing a presentation on agriculture, energy, energy use, emissions, and the future of farming. Please join me in welcoming Darren. Thank you for that introduction and, and thanks to all of you and thanks for the uh, opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, on the way in here, I was listening to a podcast and I heard a quote I'd never heard before and it was really great. It was attributed to Ursula K. Le Guin and the quote was, there are no right answers to the wrong questions. And so in my presentation today, I want to take a big picture look at agriculture, energy, emissions, where we might be going. And I want to get us to rethink the answers we have, and I want us to rethink the questions. So if I can just get my presentation up. There we go. So I'm, I'm going to start by suggesting that we have a civilizational problem, and that agriculture is really enmeshed in that problem. So, this is a graph of the last 2,022 years of the size of the global economy. So from the year zero CE, what we used to call zero AD, up until the present. And it shows the size of the global economy in trillions of dollars. And what's remarkable, of course, is that for 99% of that history, it was relatively flat, and then it took off like a rocket ship uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900 and is now going up almost vertically, doubling and redoubling. You can see how much growth there has been even just since the year 2000. Between the year 1900 and the year 2000, during the 20th century, the global economy increased 16 times. It's 16 times as large, and we're on track to do that again. We think that growth rates of 25 to 3% are normal, uh, every central bank, every government, every corporation wants to maintain growth of around 25 to 3%. But if you do that, you double the size every 25 years. So every century you have four doublings. So it goes 2, 4, 8, 16. So this is what we are attempting to do on planet Earth with the size of our economy. So now I'm just going to overlay onto that graph a graph of energy use. So those little tan diamonds, that's energy use. Not surprising, it tracks very, very closely. The problem you have is if energy use is tracking the size of the economy, and if your plan in the 21st century is to make the economy 16 times larger, you seem to have a plan to make your energy use 16 times higher, or maybe just eight, or maybe just four. At any rate, it's a big problem. And now I've added over the top of that a graph of emissions. And again, not surprising, energy use tracks the size of the global economy and emissions track energy use. So in a nutshell, this is a, a kind of an overview of the civilizational problem we've created for ourselves. That's the, the big picture and the context. We're pushing more and more energy and material into the system in order to push more material out the other end. And in many ways, that's what we're doing with agriculture too. We're pushing more and more energy and material in in order to push more food and other things out the other end. Because energy use is going up and emissions are going up, so too are temperatures. This is a graph of the temperature anomaly, <clears throat> global average over the oceans and the land area. Uh, looks at about the last 140 years, starts in 1880 and goes to the present time. And you can see we're about one degree above the long-term average. Some outlier years, some recent years are moving toward even one and a half degrees. Now, the UN 
issues a report every year called the Emissions Gaps Report. Uh, the most recent one came out uh, a couple of weeks ago, four weeks ago, and it said that we are on track for 2.6 degrees of warming. And that 2.6 degrees takes into account all the carbon taxes and EV incentives and all the policies that are in place. So even given all the policies we have in place, we're not on track for 1.5, we're not on track for two, we're on track for 2.6 degrees globally. And the problem is here on the prairies, we're warming at twice the global average rate. We're a continental interior, you know, we're far from the coastline, we're a relatively northern latitude, we're warming at twice the global average rate. So if we stay on the track we're on, and the planet warms by 2.6 degrees, we're looking at 5.2 degrees here on the prairie. So clearly something has to be done. So that's the big picture context of where we are civilizationally. I wanna now turn to look at uh, energy and food. In part two, I call it energy in, food out. So that's a picture of my farm taken a couple winters ago. And I put that up just to illustrate uh, some sort of symbolically some ideas. You can subdivide the last 10,000 years of agriculture many different ways in, in terms of the timing. But for our purposes, let's just think of the first 9,900 years uh, up until about uh, the beginning of the 20th century. And then you had the 20th century and then we've got the future. The barn you see in that picture was completed in 1918 for draft horses. It was to be the, the pulling power center of a big farm. And uh, that barn really represents the end of the era of low input, low emission, solar powered agriculture. And then we moved in the 20th century to high input, fossil fueled, high emission agriculture. And the solar panels represent a potential for the future. They represent perhaps another phase, a new phase, where we go back to lower input, solar powered, and low emission agriculture. And I just wanna take a little time to detail the transition we made in the 20th century in terms of pushing energy into the system in order to push more food out. So uh, this is a graph of the number of tractors and horses in Canada. It starts in 1910 and goes into the 1980s. Uh, I should say, I did most of the graphs in this presentation, so if you need sources, I can give those to you afterward. There's a couple I didn't do, I'll flag those. But this is uh, horses and tractors, and the, you can see there's a little red triangle near the bottom. That's 1918, that's the same year that barn got finished. It got finished just in time to be obsolete because the tractors were coming and, and horse barns weren't a thing anymore. Uh, but you can see that takeoff in the number of tractors after the First World War and the decline in the number of horses. There were, of course, tractors before the First World War, but they were just too big and heavy and expensive for most farmers to have one. But after the First World War, the smaller tractors, the, the John Deere Model D, the Ford Fordson, smaller gas and kerosene powered tractors came along, and that's when farmers really started to adopt them. But what I really want to focus on here isn't just that tractors displaced horses, it's the change in the energy system. Before, around 1918, the energy that went into farming came out of the farm. The, the energy supply for the farm was the farm fields, the forage and grass and grain that came off the farm fields. But as the tractors took over, the, the source of energy for the farm would no longer be the farm itself, the farm fields, it would be distant oil fields. It wouldn't be recent production on farm fields, it would be ancient fossil fuel. So uh, that was the first shift in terms of finding ways to push far larger quantities of energy into the food system in order to push more food out. Some decades after 1918, uh, we had uh, fo uh, fossil fuel produced fertilizers started really taking off. This is a graph of Canadian nitrogen fertilizer use. So the actual nitrogen tonnage, not the fertilizer, but the actual N. And you can see the very sharp 
upward trend line starting in the 1960s and 70s, doubling and redoubling. We have nearly doubled nitrogen fertilizer tonnage just since 2006, and it continues to go up very, very rapidly. Now, if we're talking about energy, why, why focus on fertilizer? Well, fertilizer is one of the main ways we push energy into the food system. If you went to a nitrogen fertilizer factory, you'd see a huge natural gas pipeline going in one side and a big nitrogen gas and hydrous ammonia pipe coming out the other side. It really is a way we turn fossil fuel calories from the ground into fertilizer, into food calories, into us. Um, the energy intensity of nitrogen fertilizer is such that by the time that nitrogen gets into the ground in a farm field, the energy embedded in one ton of nitrogen fertilizer is equal to about two tons of gasoline. Uh, another way you push a lot of energy into the food system is through petrochemicals. This is a graph of uh, herbicide uh, and insecticide use in Canada, and it shows that insecticide use approximately doubled between 19, uh, 1990 and 2010. And uh, yeah, insecticide use doubled and herbicide use tripled, and it's gone up more since then. So what we're doing is we are pushing ever larger quantities of energy in, in order to push ever larger quantities of food out. We're literally turning fossil fuel calories from the ground into food calories on our plates, into people on the streets and people in our shops. So <clears throat> not surprising, if we're pushing more and more energy in, and a lot of that energy is fossil fuel energy, emissions are rising. So I just want to take a minute to talk about the emissions coming out of agriculture. This is a graph produced by the, the NFU, National Farmers Union. Uh, the NFU undertook this because the government of Canada hadn't. What we thought was needed in order for farmers to reduce emissions was a really clear, comprehensive and detailed picture of those emissions. And the federal government was very good at generating data and they had these three volume reports called the National Inventory Report that were just tortuously difficult to sort of get through if you were not, uh, not uh, didn't have a PhD in emissions measurement. Uh, but over a long period of time, we managed to pull that information together and combine it with some other information and produce this graph. It's in a report that's on the NFU website uh, called Agricultural Emissions in Canada. I'll talk more about that at the end. This is a detailed graph. It shows 30 or 40 categories of emissions and soil carbon sequestration. But I'll just, because we're limited in time today, I'll just point out two things. One, the top line is going up. Emissions are rising. They're up about 33% between 1990 and 2020. And the trend line continues to go up. So that you can see the top line in that graph is going upward. Uh, we're moving emissions in the wrong direction when it comes to agriculture. The country is committed to a 30% reduction by, 20, uh, no, a 40% reduction now by 2030 and net zero by 2050. Yet agricultural emissions are, are, are going up and that's not, uh, <clears throat> not going to work if we need to get emissions down. But the other thing is why is that top line going up? It's, it's not going up because fossil fuel use in our tractors and combines and, and trucks is going up. <clears throat> Those red bars at the top are the actual fuel use. <coughs> Excuse me. And they're pretty well constant. And the top line isn't going up because emissions from cattle and livestock and manure are going up. That's the blue lines at the bottom. Uh, the herd is shrinking, the cattle herd is shrinking, so actually in recent years emissions from cattle and livestock are down. The top line's going up because those green bars in the middle are getting wider, and those green bars in the middle are emissions from nitrogen fertilizer production and use. And what's amazing about nitrogen fertilizer, and the reason it's so much talked about right now, is because nitrogen fertilizer is almost unique among all human products and processes in that it manages to make itself a major 
contributor of all three of the main greenhouse gases. Uh, carbon dioxide in its production in the fertilizer factories, methane from the upstream natural gas production, which is the main feedstock, and nitrous oxide when it's used in the field. That's why emissions from nitrogen fertilizer are so high, because it's emissions of methane, carbon dioxide, and nitrous oxide. So we're talking about energy use in the food system, so not just farms, the entire food system. This is a graph from the United States Department of Agriculture in 2017, and it shows not just the farm link, which is on your left, but also uh, processing, packaging, transport, retailing, wholesaling, uh, the fuel that people use to drive to the grocery store to get the food, and then even in-home refrigeration and, uh, and cooking. So you can see that we're using a lot of energy at every link in the chain. Uh, the emissions graph would look a little different. The emissions graph would have agriculture much higher because we've got emissions not related to energy. But just in terms of strict energy usage, you can see that it's not just the farm, but we've got energy use all downstream from the farm as well. This energy use is extremely high. It's, it's unprecedented. Um, we have created the least energy efficient food system anywhere, the least energy efficient food system in human history. And the two numbers on here aren't directly comparable, and I'll say a little bit about that in a minute, but roughly speaking, for every calorie that comes out of our food system, we have to push in about 13.3 calories, and most of that is fossil fuels. Now, if you look at traditional uh, agricultural systems, traditional societies, peasant food systems, they're only putting in about 0.2 calories to get one calorie out. They've got a, about a five to one return, and that makes sense. You'd have to get more calories out than you put in, or you'd starve to death. If you expended two calories of work with your body, to grow one calorie of food, you'd, you'd quickly starve to death. But we've done something because we have access not just to the, the food calories to run the food system, we also have those fossil fuel calories to run the food system. We can run our food system at massive losses. So we're putting in 13.3 and we're getting out one. So this is the third part, the second last part. So energy in, food out, but I wanna just problematize this idea that it's, it's food that we're taking out the other end. So we're, putting, we're pushing in maximum amounts of energy and material. We're pushing out maximum yield, maximum output tonnage, but also maximum waste and dissipation. So we've got food waste in Canada. Some numbers are as high as 40%. I, I don't think that's all avoidable food waste, but avoidable food waste is certainly somewhere around 20, 25% for sure. Uh, in addition to that wasted food, we're denutritionalizing a lot of food. We're taking a lot of high quality, nutritionally dense inputs and turning them into colas and cheese puffs and pop tarts and all sorts of things that are giving us health problems and obesity. We're taking a huge quantity of that fertilizer expanded and energy expanded food supply and turning it into biofuels and burning it in single occupant vehicles that are commuting and maybe don't need to even be on the road. We're feeding a tremendous amount of grain to livestock and I wanna draw a distinction between grazing and grain feeding. Grazing uh, is in almost all cases a very positive thing, but grain feeding can be very inefficient and at certain scales very negative. And we're doing other things, like we're pouring energy intensive fertilizer onto acres to grow cotton that we turn into fast fashion that people buy cheap wear a couple times and then discard. So it's not just that we're feeding massive quantities of energy in to push massive quantities of energy or food out. We're also then taking that enhanced food output and wasting and dissipating it. So <clears throat> just to understand that a little better, I just wanna focus for a minute on the Green Revolution. <clears throat> so some of you may know uh, the name Norman Borlaug. Norman Borlaug was the father of the Green Revolution. He found ways to, to crossbreed wheat and rice and other crops so that they would work better with fertilizer and irrigation and chemicals. He essentially re-engineered plants for high input 
food systems. And Borlaug was very clear. Uh, I won't read you this whole quote, but the key is Norman Borlaug saw fertilizer as the fuel that powered the forward thrust of the Green Revolution. It wasn't just plant breeding and human cleverness and genetics. It was actually changing the plants so that they would work well and they wouldn't grow up to very tall heights and then fall over when they were heavily fertilized and irrigated, etc. <coughs> so a lot of you know about the Green Revolution, but less well known is the Livestock Revolution. And this is a quote by Mark Sutton. And what Mark Sutton said is, the Green Revolution, by pushing more and more inputs in, pushed a lot more output out, but then that output was largely used to feed livestock. And the key there is the global nitrogen cycle is dominated by humanity's use of reactive nitrogen to raise livestock. And this is a simplified graph, but um, you'll see coming out of cropland, the number 49, that's 49 million tons of nitrogen. And some of you will know nitrogen is kind of the main constituent of protein, so you can think of that as a proxy for protein. But look what we do with it. 16 of those 49 million tons are directly consumed by humans, but 33 go into AFO, that's animal feeding operations. So Sutton's right. The human use of nitrogen, and that nitrogen comes from fossil fuels, the human use of nitrogen is dominated by livestock production. Most of the, the produce coming out of our cropland goes into animal feeding. Now, this next graph I'm going to show you is perhaps the most important that you we're going to see here today, well, in my presentation. This is a graph of the last 50,000 years of wild animal biomass, livestock biomass, and human biomass on planet Earth. And it shows what we are doing with all of that energy that we turn into fertilizer, that we turn into larger crops and feed grains, where that actually ends up. So I'll just walk you through this. On the left is 50,000 years ago. That brown bar is the wild animal biomass tonnage on Earth. Then in the middle, you see 11,000 years ago, just before the dawn of agriculture. Again, the Earth is dominated by wild animals. There would be a tiny sliver on the bottom of blue they can't even see there for humans. Um, but again, it's, it's dominated by wild animals, even though the number is lower partly as a result of human predation in the intervening 40,000 years. But on the right, you see the situation today. At the very bottom of that stacked bar graph, you see the little bit of brown. That's the remaining wild animal biomass. And then that big chunk of tan in the middle, that's the livestock biomass on Earth right now. And then the blue on the top is the human biomass. And some of you may have heard on the radio or elsewhere, uh, in the last couple of days, we passed 8 billion people. That quantity, that tonnage of human and livestock biomass on the right would just not be possible were it not for massive injections of fossil fuel into fertilizer, into grains, into livestock feeding, and into other crops that feed humans and that feed livestock. So it's not just a production issue. It's not just that we're pushing energy in and pushing food out. It's what we're doing with that and the other end. Uh, just briefly, this is just a graph of the losses when you feed grain to livestock. Uh, because of the way animals metabolize food, most of that food energy goes not for building muscle or building mass. It goes just for keeping the animal alive, respiration um, during their lifetime. So you've got losses. You're running the system at about 80 to 90% loss. You're putting 5 to 10 calories or 5 to 10 units of protein in for every one that you get out the other end. So I'm just going to conclude with a few general observations. The time we have here isn't enough to go into all the very detailed things that we could say about how to redirect and transform agriculture. Uh, I'll show you at the very end four reports that the National Farmers Union has done over the last three years, and many of those reports are available at the NFU table in at the trade show, but I'll just give you some, uh, some general takeaways here. The first is 
to recognize that we've created the least efficient, highest emission food system in history. And I've heard high-ranking politicians, provincially and federally, constantly say it's the most efficient food system ever, which is just the opposite of the truth. Of course, every peasant with a hoe is running a zero input, zero fossil fuel, zero net emission food system. And, and we don't come close. I mean, that much at least should be obvious to anyone who thinks about it for a minute. We've maximized energy inputs, which has allowed us to maximize commodity tonnage outputs. But rather than doing wise and careful things with that very precious output, instead we've set up a whole bunch of systems of biofuels and grain feeding and junk food and food waste where, where we just waste and dissipate huge quantities of it. So to deal with this, you know, techno tweaks and bolt-on solutions and small changes to business as usual just aren't going to work. We need near wartime levels of ambition and action. We need to take the industrial capacity of the world and we need to sort of repurpose it and redirect it for five or ten years at minimum. And we need a government-led mobilization for system transformation. Transformation of our transportation systems, our production and consumption systems, our housing systems, our energy systems, and to some extent our food systems as well. And along the way we need to change our goals. We just met our recent food export goal of $75 billion a year, and it was, it, we barely met that when they, they came out with another, even higher, food export goal. And those food export goals drive production, and production drives input use, and a, a maximum export system tends to be a maximum output system, and that tends to be a maximum input system, and that tends to be a maximum emission system. And that's just incompatible with where we need to go. So we need to look at input optimization, fossil fuel minimization, emissions minimization, waste reduction, but also things like production and consumption reduction. We're probably going to need to find ways to reduce production, not increase it, and reduce consumption, not increase it. And that can make room for things like biodiversity and rewilding and uh, grazing and, and, and more diverse rotations. And a lot of the things that are being prototyped and pioneered and demonstrated and refined and showcased by organic producers. So I, I think everyone can figure out what the conclusions are. We need to replace fossil fuels with zero emission sources. We need to move our critical materials in circles again. The biosphere was sustainable for billions of years because it moved its key materials in circles carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, water, what have you. Uh, we've made linear systems, we need to go back to circular systems. We need to moderate our demands upon the system and reduce production, and we need to actually measure and prioritize true sustainability. So I'll just conclude. Um, the National Farmers Union has produced four detailed reports over the last three years. Together, I think they total 250 or 300 pages. So any of you who want more information, more details on solutions are urged uh, to, to look at those. They're all available at nfu.ca, www.nfu.ca. Some of them are available on the uh, NFU table in the uh, trade show. I urge you to go there and, and have a look there and talk to the people there. Um, the first one, 2019, Tackling the Farm Crisis and the Climate Crisis, really lays out the problem and the solution in a fairly detailed way. Uh, a year later, we came up with a report called Imagine If, envisioning a near zero emission food system for Canada. And it, it's a very positive, very hopeful report. If, if, if you're looking for hope and positivity, that's the one for you. It invites the reader to sort of imagine themselves in 2030, imagine we did everything right, and then it walks them through how we got to that set of solutions in 2030 and all the other things that, that were helped out along the way that, you know, farm debt was lower and farm income was higher, et cetera. Then earlier this year, we did that report uh, on emissions. I showed you that very detailed graph on agricultural emissions. And then 
a couple of months ago, we came out with our most recent report called Nitrogen Fertilizer, Key Farm Input, sorry, Critical Nutrient, Key Farm Input, and Major Environmental Problem. And it just looks at how important nitrogen is to life. Most of you will know that. And how important nitrogen fertilizer even is to agriculture and the sort of human civilization. But just how many, many problems in water and atmosphere and, and the biosphere it creates when it is overused. And it really is being overused. Some of you may know, compared to pre-industrial times, humanity has tripled the tonnage of nitrogen flowing through the terrestrial biosphere. We've, we've taken control of that lever and, and just yanked it and tripled the total amount of nitrogen flowing through Earth systems. Uh, and just one more resource, it's, uh, it's a book I wrote uh, in 2019 called Civilization Critical Energy, Food, Nature in the Future. And it again takes a, a big picture look at, at what we're trying to do and the possible threats and dangers and how we can do things better. So thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take questions. Uh, thanks, Darren, for that really pessimistic, de yeah, uh, depressing report. Um, now, uh, I'm a retired history prof, <laughs> pretending to be a farmer with my son. Um, my question, uh, uh, and I noticed you had a degree in history. When you look historically, are there, po are there encouraging signs? Because you're talking about this is how we've screwed up to the present and this is what we need to do to go into the future. Um, are there good things that we have already done? Uh, for example, I came across a master's uh, thesis some time ago that suggested that the sh shelter belts planted through the PFRA program in Saskatchewan uh, and those that are still existing, not having been bulldozed down, uh, actually make uh, the GHG emissions in Saskatchewan neutral. I don't know whether there's any value or truth to that. It just, some, some guy told me that he had done his master's from our, uh, from our conservation shed district. I found that interesting. Um, we've had GPS-driven tractors now for 20 years. We've had clean diesel technology for, I don't know, a dozen years. Um, We've, 2% uh, of Saskatchewan uh, land is now organic ag. I mean, are there things that we have already done that you could somehow comment on or quantify? Well, there's a vast number of things. We, we need to really relentlessly pillage the past for good ideas. Because as I said, the, you, you said this is pessimistic, and in some ways it is. But the, the optimistic thing is, for 9,900 years, for 99% of the time that we've had agriculture on Earth, it has been low input, solar powered, low emission. We've only got it wrong for 1% of the time. And so there's a lot of things we can take from the past, and there's, but we can't just look to the past, of course, because in the past we didn't have the kind of demands we have now, so we're gonna have to sort of make a hybrid where we take the best ideas from the future as well. But, there are some things from the near past, and you mentioned the Shelter Belt program. One of the things we're trying to get the federal government to do is take the lessons from the PFRA. That was the reaction to the 1930s climate crisis. Take the lessons from the PFRA and create a new agency that we call the CFRA, the Canadian Farm Resilience Agency, the CFRA. Have it operate across Canada maybe thousands, potentially thousands of independent agrologists focused on something other than selling agribusiness input products, focused on input optimization, truly independent with nothing to sell, focused on helping farmers adapt to the future, running demonstration farms where low emission production systems can be showcased and refined. So that's an example. Uh, the PFRA was created in, what, 35? So about 80, 80 some years ago. That's something from the near past, we think that was a fantastic idea. And that's the kind, you know, I mentioned a near wartime effort. It's that kind of capacity that we, those sorts of things we need. So yeah, there's a lot of things we can look to. Those shelter belts, absolutely. And you know, the, the good ideas from thousands of years of agriculture about cycling nutrients rather than linear flows of nutrients, et cetera. 
<laughs> I, uh, Anna and I are from the U.S., wrong side of the border. Um, we're active members of the Farmers Union in our country, and awesome organization, lots of progressive ideas, yet any time we even bring up the possibility of limiting ethanol production gets nowhere in the policy arena. And so my question, based on that experience, is is there any appetite even within your organization for these ideas? Uh, because whenever we bring it up in policy debates, it's, it's received as we are speaking against family farm agriculture if we do anything that limits ethanol. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, thanks for that question. And, and the, the National Farmers Union in the United States is quite different than Canada and quite different again than in the UK. And I've worked a little bit with the UK and US and quite a bit with the one in Canada. Uh, the Canadian National Farmers Union is quite clear in its opposition to biofuels, in its opposition to ethanol, etc. And that's been the position for a long time. It just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to us. I was at a NFU convention uh, quite some time ago and somebody went to the microphone and started talking about thermodynamics and one of the officials leaned over to me and says, I love being the head of an organization where the members go to the mic and talk about thermodynamics. <laughs> But the main, the main point that was made in that, uh, that question was uh, it just doesn't make sense to turn energy into food into energy because there's large entropic losses along the way. And that's really what we're doing. We forget how much energy we push into the food system. And then we see this food there that's surplus to need. And we think, wow, we should turn this into energy, forgetting that it was energy we turned into food in the first place. And there's large losses and very, uh, yeah, it, there's ethical problems and a whole bunch of other problems with that. Thanks. Thanks, Darren, for that great talk. Um, I think that um, one of the things that's in those other reports, which I've read and I encourage others to do, that he mentioned at the end of his talk, um, which is key, um, is um, there's, a, there's a graph, and I can't remember one, which one I think you'll tell me, um, that shows productivity versus real farm income. Um, and I think there's a resistance among farmers often to reduction in production because we feel close to the line already. It's hard to make the per acre dollars work. Um, and it should be remembered, and I think we should be clear when we're talking about these systems, that somebody's making a lot of money. Uh, real, real productivity from, from farms, this, this system that pushes more energy in and more production out, has made some people very, very, very rich. It's just not farmers. Um, and the resistance to changing that system uh, is, I think, often foisted upon farmers because we are anxious about our real farm incomes. Um, and it, we should be clear about who's benefiting, and, and it's not us, mostly, right? Like, when um, we move canola production 30 bushels or 40 bushels an acre up over 20 or 30 years, our real farm income doesn't increase. But uh, the people who make GMO canola do pretty well, and the people who make nitrogen fertilizer do pretty well, and John Deere does pretty well. Um, and, and I think when we're talking about the political problem of moving those, those into a more circular system, we should be clear about who's opposed here, right? Because I think often, in the media, it's talked about farmers are worried about, oh, we'll have to reduce our, our nitrogen use or our diesel fuel use, and, and we're painted as the people who are worried about it. Um, but we're not seeing the benefits, really, from that increased production. And um, I think uh, political problems need enemies, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, and, and we should be clear about who that is here. So if you want to comment on that at all. Well, just to say those are great points, and uh, you're right, we do explore those in these NFU reports, and I don't discount the difficulty of getting collectively to a place where less production can mean more net income, because unfortunately, we're all on a treadmill. You know, reducing our own production doesn't increase the price, um, so we're all incentivized to maximize production. 
but the, the planet system as a whole just cannot continue with this kind of maximum production system. And, and Will is also right in that the, the long-term outcome of using more and more inputs to produce more and more production is a shrinking, shrinking margins, especially, well, for conventional farmers, for sure. Do we have time for one more? One more question, yeah. Okay, I'll be quick. Um, so when you uh, look at the losses with, say, uh, animal agriculture, of the loss of energy there. Are you putting any uh, value on the, the manure that's, that they leave behind as, as part of the energy or no? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, mostly no. So, so instead of, of, of looking at energy loss, and I'm, I mean, this is maybe a, not a great topic, but I, I just think of the energy we're consuming here in this room and I, and I think of what happens where that energy goes. Like, can we not reimagine? Like, I've traveled through Ethiopia back in the back country. There's no such thing as washers. I actually don't know what happens. I don't need to know. But, like, we, we need to reimagine where we're getting our energy from. And, and there's, there's losses that we need to look at and find us. And I, I agree. It needs to be a safe way of recapturing that in my mind instead of, necessarily always going after a bad guy. I, I don't know. No, good comments, thank you. <laughs>